Time to thank and praise God. Let us say the Christian family prayer together. Our Father in the heavens all around us, honoured be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive anyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation, but protect us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Lil. We're now going to talk about the English that will be in the Bible talk this morning. The first is a phrase, in a nutshell. We can use the phrase, in a nutshell, when we want to explain something very briefly. Give only the main points. Use the fewest number of words possible. Summarize everything that happened with just a few words. Another phrase we can use which has a similar meaning is to make a long story short. Example one, Jane said to her friend, look, I don't wanna tell you the whole complicated story about why I have purple hair, but what I can say is this, in a nutshell, I bought the wrong hair dye. Bow, bow. Example two. Residents from the Queensland town of Toowoomba have embraced the sport of Buhurt, also known as Historic Medieval Battle, HMB. Competitors dress in full sets of armour made from steel and titanium. Competitor, Mr. Webland says, knees, elbows, punches, and headbutts are all legal, but you can't stab with the weapons. That's the rules in a nutshell. Sounds fun. I wonder why you can't stab, because they've, they've got armor on. <laughs> anyway, now it's time to have a little discussion with the people next to you or the people you're listening at home with, you need to complete the following sentence. In a nutshell, I come to church because... Da, 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 da. So two minutes to finish that sentence. Thank you, everyone. Our next bit of English is a verb. It's the word spoil. If something, ooh, if something spoils, then it deteriorates, it rots, it loses its beauty and value, it is seriously damaged. If something spoils, then it is no longer useful to you. Example one, Healthline magazine says that the main problem with eating whole natural foods is that they tend to spoil easily. 
However, many healthy foods can be stored long term as long as you have the right temperature and moisture conditions. They say these health foods do not spoil easily. Nuts, dried grains, canned fruit, and yes, dark chocolate. Um, example two, Danish cyclist Soren Krag Andersen has won stage 14 of the Tour de France. Although COVID-19 restrictions meant there were no spectators at the finish line, Soren said that it didn't spoil the victory. He said, when I got to the finish line, I celebrated alone. It doesn't matter, it's the same emotions. Our next word is metaphor, it's a noun. A metaphor is when we compare one thing with another. Usually the two things we are comparing are alike. A metaphor describes something that is unfamiliar to us by using something else that we know well. Do you know what this metaphor is? Time is money. When we use a metaphor, we say something equals something. A metaphor is a word picture that compares two things we wouldn't normally put together. Some examples. Life is a roller coaster. The computer was an old dinosaur. Anyway, let's now have a discussion. So you have two minutes to look at these metaphors. In each of the following metaphors, what two things are being compared and what does each metaphor mean? So what two things are being compared and what does each metaphor mean? So number one, his words cut deeper than a knife. Two, she has a bubbly personality. Three, he was fishing for compliments. So you have two minutes to talk to the people around you or the people you're with. Thank you very much, everyone. Good work. Oh, so the three bits of English today we had are, in a nutshell, metaphor, and spoil. So they'll be in the, the Bible talk today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. 
a time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Together, gracious God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Today, as we hear your voice, please open up our hearts to you and strengthen us in your ways so that we may live for you. Amen. Today's reading from the Bible is from John 6. The Apostle John says this. The next day, the crowd realized that Jesus had not gone into the boat with his disciples and that they had left without him. Soon, other boats came to shore near the place where the crowd had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into those boats and went to Cabernet looking for him. When the people found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Teacher, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I assure you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the bread and were filled. Do not work for food that spoils, but work for the food that lasts to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has placed his seal of approval on him. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe the one he has sent. The people said, what sign are you going to do so we may see and believe you? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the real bread from heaven, because the bread of God is the one who comes from the heaven and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, always give us this bread. Then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, or whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out, because I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This, in a nutshell, is his will, that I should not lose any of the ones he has given to me, but that I should raise them up on the last day. Because what my father wants is that all who see the Son and believe him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for reading, Edwina. That was very well done. 
Uh, today we're continuing our series uh, in John's Gospel and we're looking at, uh, as you can see there on the screen, uh, the idea of Jesus being uh, the bread of life and what that means. And really, uh, today is an invitation. Uh, you won't get all the answers today. Today is an invitation for all of us to think about this metaphor for ourselves, to begin thinking about what it means that Jesus is the bread of life. Uh, so I hope you uh, uh, are willing to do that today. Uh, how about we begin by praying? Father, we do thank you that uh, in you is life, no darkness, but pure light and life. And we thank you from you comes the life that we need. And we uh, thank you for Jesus and how he uh, shows us who he is, the bread of life. We ask that today will be the beginning where we uh, begin to understand all that that means for us, that he gives us your life in us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, metaphors you know, are very uh, beautiful things, I think. They're wonderful things, very useful things that help us to understand many complex things in our world. And I wanted to start today just by giving you a few quick examples of uh, metaphors that I think are very helpful for us. For example, uh, if you have a very stubborn person, you, call, you say that that person has a heart of stone. Someone who's very lazy and who spends all their time, you know, just looking at screens, we'll, we call them a couch potato. That's what they are. We can describe, you know, the best of friends as two peas in a pod. An angry teacher, well, obviously they are a dragon. Someone who is always scared is called a chicken. A chaotic classroom is obviously a zoo. <laughs> and we all know this one. A teenager's stomach is a bottomless pit. Now, friends, these are all you know, very useful metaphors that you can use, and they're very powerful because they give us these you know, pictures, they're word pictures that describe complex things. And even Jesus uses metaphors to describe who he is. He says things like, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He says, I am the bread of life. These are all metaphors that Jesus used to explain who he is. And the beauty of metaphors is they don't say just one thing. You know, metaphors are complex. They make you think. They need you to think so you understand what they're trying to teach us. And so this morning, as we begin looking at, you know, one of the metaphors that Jesus uses for himself, I am the bread of life, Jesus wants us to really think, to keep thinking about what this word picture means about him. And he wants us to do this so that we understand him better and grow closer to him. So, friends, this morning... Let's begin at looking at the day after that Jesus fed the 5,000 families. Look at verse 24. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum, looking for him. When the people found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Teacher, w when did you get here? Now, friends, Jesus has just fed the day before 5,000 families with, you know, a couple of sardines and five dinner rolls. And the next day when the people wake up and they discover that Jesus is not there with them, well, of course, they go looking for him. And the most determined people in the crowd get in boats, cross the sea, and after much, much searching, they find Jesus. But when they do find Jesus, Jesus shows us something that may surprise us. 
He teaches us that not everyone who is looking for Jesus wants to be a disciple of Jesus. Look at what Jesus says to these very determined people who really, really look for him. Verse 26. Jesus answered, I assure you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the bread and were filled. Now, if you think about it, this is a little bit strange. You see, these people who have looked for Jesus, well, they were there yesterday. They were there with the crowds. They saw Jesus feed thousands, which means that they saw the sign that Jesus did. But Jesus looks at them and he says, you're here not because you saw the sign, because your stomachs were filled. Now, what is Jesus trying to teach them and us? Well, I think that Jesus is trying to teach us that it is possible to look but not see. It's possible to see but not perceive. It's possible to experience something incredible but not understand what has happened. And so the question is, well, what did these people see the day before? Well, what they saw was someone who fed them. And now they're back for more. That's who these people are. And Jesus, you know, as he sees them coming to him, he can see what's in them. He sees right through them. He perceives what's in their hearts. He knows what motivates them. And so he knows that these people don't really want him. Not really. They just want what he can give to them. And friends, there's a very big difference between those two things. There's a big difference between really wanting Jesus and just wanting what he gives to you. Now, friends, have you ever had someone in your life who treated you like that? You know, someone who was your friend only because you could give stuff to them. Have you ever had someone like that in your life? It's not much of a friendship, is it? You feel used. You feel more like a Coke machine than a person. Or perhaps worse still, perhaps you've used someone like that. Yeah, you've been someone's friend just because of what they can give you. Friends, last week we saw that you know people want things. People in our world really want things. Success, security, freedom from trouble, a a wife, a husband, perfect children, a nice house, a nice car in a nice suburb. And there's nothing wrong with these things. I mean, they're good things that God gives to people for people to enjoy. But we must always remember that all these things, all these good things, they will spoil they will end. They will either rot or rust or thieves will break in and steal. They're all temporary. And really Jesus is trying to say here, you know, if you just want me for the things that I give you, then you don't really want me. You don't want the person You just want the blessings, the the benefits of membership. And that is not a friendship. And yet as Jesus speaks to these people who he knows, they just want to use him. He knows that. He's just so kind. You know, if I had someone in my life who just wanted to be with me because of the things that I could give to them, well, that person would not be my friend for very long. 
But listen to how Jesus, who knows they want to use him, listen to how he speaks to them in verse 27. Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils, but work for the food that lasts to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the Father has placed his seal of approval on him. Friends, there's no condemnation in these words. It's so surprising. He knows they want to use him. He doesn't condemn. Instead, he speaks the truth plainly and in love. And what Jesus is trying to teach them is that everything in, in this world that people normally you know, work for and put all their energy into, all their time, set their hopes on, all those things, well, they will one day spoil. They'll disappoint. They'll leave you empty-handed. It's only a matter of time. Instead, Jesus gives people a choice, a clear choice for everyone. He says, work for something else. Work for something that's permanent. Use all your God-given talents and energies, your time, your skills, your mind, your body. Use all those things for getting a different kind of food. A food that lasts, that will not spoil, that will not disappoint. Jesus says, work for the food that will fill you with eternal life. Work for that. Put your energy into that. Put your time into that. Don't waste your time. Put your time to get the food that fills you with eternal life. Now, friends, when many people hear the words eternal life, the first thing they think of automatically is a life that lasts forever. But... The truth is that the most important thing about eternal life is not that it lasts forever. The most important thing about eternal life is not that uh, the life just goes on and on and on. And we can know this because if you you visit a nursing home and you watch people, you see people whose life goes on and on and on, you will see that many of their lives are almost not worth living. You know, they're they're horrible lives. That's not the most important thing about eternal life. The most important thing about eternal life is that it is a different kind of life. It has a different quality to it. The eternal life that Jesus fills us with is a life that has a supernatural quality to it. It has God's peace, God's love, God's joy, God's gentleness. It gives you meaning and significance. It fills your life with God's goodness. It is an eternal kind of life. And of course, it will be a life that lasts forever because God is eternal in his being. And so Jesus' advice to these people is to work for that. Work for the food that fills you with eternal life. And so the next question, the obvious question is, well, what do we have to do? What do I have to do to start enjoying that eternal life? And that is the question that these people Asked Jesus, thank you, Isaac. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the work that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, in a nutshell, to believe the one he sent. Friends, Jesus is trying to teach them that it's all about him. 
It's all about Jesus. You see, Christianity isn't really about following rules. It's not about keeping church traditions alive. It's not about denominations and which one is best. It's not about things that God sort of, you know, he happens to like. That's not at the heart of Christianity. Because at the heart of Christianity, the most important thing about Christianity the thing that makes Christianity is knowing a person. Jesus. That is what Christianity is all about. Knowing a person. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. Having an appropriate teacher-student relationship with Jesus. Where he is the teacher who leads and teaches. And where we are his students and friends who learn from him. That is what Christianity is all about. It's all about him. You see, friends, Christianity is like no other religion in the world. I mean, if you take Buddhism and take Buddha out of Buddhism, if you get Islam and take Muhammad out of Islam. Nothing changes for those religions. Because those religions are philosophies. They have teachings about you know, what you should do and ideas that you should have in your head. But Christianity isn't really about that. That's not where you start. Christianity is about a person, Jesus. And that person must come into your life and fill your life so we can start enjoying eternal life. That is what being a Christian is all about. You see, it's only as we accept Jesus, live with him each day, with him in our lives, that we begin to change what we think and what we do. And so at the heart of being a Christian is meeting Jesus talking to Jesus, listening to Jesus, living your life with Jesus. And friends, this is why little children can become Christians. I mean, little children aren't very good with philosophy. You know, they can't work out complex ideas. And little children aren't very good at following rules. We all know that. But little children can meet a person. They can meet Jesus. They can listen to Jesus. They can talk to Jesus. They can live their lives with Jesus. They can include Jesus in their lives every single day. They can be followers of Jesus. They can start living eternal life right now. Because it's all about meeting and knowing a person. And friends, perhaps little children are better at doing that with God than we are. <laughs> and that's why so often Jesus says, become like little children. Unless you become like little children, you will not see the kingdom of God. Friends, it's all about Jesus. That's what he's trying to teach these people. It's all about knowing Jesus. And so now will these people finally turn to Jesus, follow him, entrust their lives to him and begin enjoying eternal life with Jesus right now? Will they do it? Well, listen to these words. Verse 30. The people said, what sign are you going to do so that we may believe you? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Friends, Jesus says, it's all about me. They say, prove it. Do you think they really want him? Do you really think they want to be followers of Jesus? They don't really want him. 
They just want the things that he can give them. And really, they are saying something like, you know, Jesus, do something spectacular right here, right in front of us, right now. Do it so we will see it and then we'll have to believe you. But friends, yesterday, Jesus did that and they were there and they saw it and it didn't work. It's not about miracles. It's about knowing Jesus, knowing who he is, accepting him into your life. And it's very interesting here that the people are almost comparing you know, the bread that Jesus fed the 5,000 families with. They're comparing that with the bread that Moses used to feed the people in the wilderness you know, it's almost like they were saying, well, look, Jesus, what you did yesterday, that was pretty impressive. But you only did it once. And it was barley bread. Ugh. Barley bread's the bread that poor people make. You know, that's not that great. I mean, Moses, the one we do trust, the one we do believe in, well, he was the real stuff. He fed God's people with bread that came from heaven. So just do that. Then we'll believe you. Now, friends, if you've ever read the Old Testament, thanks, Isaac, you'll know in the book of Exodus that for 40 years God fed his people by sending manna bread every morning. And they collected that bread and it fed them for that day. But listen to how Jesus describes that bread and describes himself. In the next verse, thanks Isaac, he says this. Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. Because the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You see, Jesus saying is, that bread, all those years ago, that was a sign that was pointing God's people to something that would happen in the future. Something that was bigger and better than what Moses did. And that time has now come. Because the bread I give doesn't feed people just for one day or one week, or one year, or even 40 years, and they die. I'm better than that. And the bread that I give isn't like Moses' bread that was only given to some people, the Israelites. No, the bread I give is for everyone, every nation, every tongue, every language. It's for everyone, and it will feed them forever. I am that Food. Friends, Jesus says it's all about Him. It's all about knowing Him. It's not about rules and regulations and traditions. It's all about knowing Him, feeding on Him, including Him in your life every day to begin to enjoy the eternal kind of life that exists in God Himself and that the Son of Man will give to us. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them and us. Look at the next verse. Thank you, Isaac. Then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Friends, metaphors are very deep and complex ways to describe the world that we live in. And Jesus uses this metaphor, I am the bread of life. That's a very deep, complex word picture. And so we need to keep 
thinking about what this means. What does he mean by this? And really, over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend more time trying to unpack what this means. So we can understand him more clearly, more deeply, so we can begin to enjoy the life that he gives. And so during the week, I invite you to you know, quietly sit somewhere, put the distractions aside, and think, pray, talk to him, ask him, what does it mean that you're the bread of life? Let's finish with these words. Thank you, Isaac. Then Jesus said these words. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes me will never be thirsty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the giver of life. And we thank you for your son, whom you sent into this world to give the world your life. Father, over the next few weeks, please help us to really understand what it means that Jesus is the bread of life. Help us to understand what it means to feed on him. Help us to understand what it means to live with him each day. And Father, we ask this for your glory and for our eternal good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, we have one question. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, our discussion question for today is, uh, Jesus says, you know, I am the bread of life. I would like you, with the people around you, whether you're here at church or at home, to spend, you know, a few minutes talking about what that could mean. You know, use your imagination. What does it mean that Jesus is the bread of life? So we'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll come back together. So enjoy your conversations.
Hey everyone, thank you for praying for our youth yesterday. We had kick live streaming yesterday. It was a really great event. Um, uh, one of the main messages was um, realizing that, recognizing that Jesus is like a big splash. So when the splash starts, um, it creates ripples. And so at the time we were going through the Thessalonians, um, and at that time. Um, they heard the message of Jesus, which was a big splash, and it rippled out to the Thessalonians. And it kind of helped us to realise that um, we can also be part of those ripples um, as long as we continue to share the message of Jesus. Um, so I'm just going to pray for our youth <coughs> um, and our church. Thank you. Kind Heavenly Father, um, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that you have a desire to be close to us and you want us to, to know you so that you can give us all the things that you desire for us to have. And it's all the things that we look for, that we, that we strive to have in our lives. We just don't realise it yet. And we just pray, Father God, that as you um, continue to work in our church here at Camp C, that you um, build us up um, help us to um, be a reflection of who you are, of who Jesus is. Help us to share the love of, to share your love with others through the way that we care for each other. I pray for the older generation in our church, Lord. May they be a great example to the younger people here. May they not be afraid to share their story of how they came, how they showed how you showed your love to them because it encourages and edifies us when we learn about the work that you are doing in each of our lives. Help us to share that well with one another so that the ripple can continue and spread out to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray, Father God, um, that you help us to see that you really just want to take care of us. And we really want these young people who are still growing up and trying to figure out the world, we really want them to understand that there are answers to all these crazy questions in their head and there are great answers in Jesus. So I pray, Father God, that you help us to teach them well, help us to guide them well to your word so that they can grow to have a great relationship with you themselves. And may we learn to do that well so that it can be passed on to the younger generations in our church and ripple out for many years to come. We thank you so much, Lord, that through Jesus we can see exactly who you are and to see that you as our creator, um, through everything that we have in our lives, from all of nature that's all around us, through the things that we enjoy in life, our hobbies, our, um, our gifts, our talents. They're all things that you gave us, you created us to have, to enjoy and to share with one another. But they're all things to glorify you because you made us that way. Help us to see that. Help us to want to know you more so that we can live the lives that you have for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, as we close, we're going to finish by speaking to God and saying these words uh, together. Dear Father, take us and work through us to serve and love you and all people in the power of your Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Enjoy your morning tea.